this. I'm 11 years old and I'm in grade 5. And I'm making this video for the British Columbia Virtual Regional Science Fair. My project is about dimensions. What a dimension is, different kinds of shapes in different dimensions, different kinds of shapes that are unique to different dimensions, and patterns that are common in all dimensions. As well as a bit of bonus math as for the Pythagorean theorem generalized to higher dimensions other than 2D. But to illustrate all that, I've created homemade models. It's really interesting to think that something that isn't really graspable, we can still get a sense of it by using analogies to our world in three dimensions. To think about it, we can experience four dimensions in a similar way two-dimensional people experience three dimensions. But the main reason why I chose this project is that it really helps us visualize that we can't see something, but we can think of what it looks like. Okay, so before we really look into the world of, er of most dimensions, I really think it's necessary, necessary to define what a dimension even is. Well, dimension is kind of a direction. It's like we can imagine it as some sort of axis. You might have known about Cartesian planes where the two lines are perpendicular to each other. And that's actually what makes two dimensions two dimensions. So in three dimensions, the corners of a room is the best place to see this in action. In a room, there's one going up, one going sideways, and one going forward. These three directions are perpendicular to each other. And since there are three of these, there are three dimensions in that space. So in the case of zero dimensions, it's not a single direction. So you can already tell it's just a point. A line, you're looking at one dimension. Polygons and those stuff with two dimensions are defined with two perpendicular axes. And it's really, really easy to visualize these earlier dimensions. Turns out, the thickness of two dimensions is not definite. If something doesn't have thickness, it's two-dimensional. So technically, paper is not two-dimensional. It has a thickness of 100 microns. Now we have at least a simple generalization of what a dimension is. Let's move on. Okay, so now that we have a basic understanding on what a dimension is, let's look at the simple shapes of zero and one dimensions. Points and lines are simple shapes and are the only shapes in zero and one dimensions, respectively. When you take a point and move it across and then connect those two points, you have a line. Except the points don't really have definite size. They're camouflaged in the line, which it itself is invisible. Points and lines have no definite size, but points are not only really quite interesting. It's impossible to actually visualize a point. All this time, have you thought you've been thinking of a point? But you can't. This kind of is self-compressing the fact that a point has no definite size, and so no matter how we draw it, it's always going to be two-dimensional. And so, no matter how we draw it, no matter how thin and tiny it is, it's not going to be a true zero-dimensional point. This is really crushing our limits because we don't realize that we can't visualize zero or one dimensions without making the shapes that we use to visualize them two dimensional. In other words, it is impossible to see either a true point or a true line because they have no definite size. So really, are zero D and one D devised concepts? I guess. And that's a quick overview to lines and points. The only thing left in this section is two dimensions. And two dimensions is special in the fact that it is the only dimension with an infinite amount of regular shapes. Shapes with equal side lengths and angles. We call these shapes regular polygons. And we use them in day-to-day -day life. Equilateral triangles, squares, and the usual kinds of pentagons and hexagons. And all those higher shapes from icosagons to chilagons. They're all regular polygons because they have equal side lengths and angles. Turns 
out there's a specific amount that each angle can be. And for any regular polygon, the ratio of the sides is always 1, 2, 1, with as many 1's as there are sides. So a 1,000 sided polygon has a ratio of 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. Going on until we have a thousand ones for a million, it's one to one to up to a million. You get the idea. Now, in two dimensions, there are really only five that are really, really commonly used. They are the triangle, the square, the pentagon, the hexagon, and the octagon. Now, something really, 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 really interesting about squares. You can put if you project them on different surfaces, you can make squares of different side lengths. Turns out, if you make a square on a sphere, it will not be a complete, total square. The angles will be different. If we project some a triangle onto a sphere, we get a three-sided square. You can do the same by projecting a pentagon in some shape and get a five-sided square. Pentagons are pretty interesting. If you take the pentagon and add all its diagonals, you get a two-dimensional representation of the four-dimensional shape called the five cell. And based on our definition that something perpendicular is at a 90 degree angle, we can also say that a square is an extended line perpendicular to itself in the second dimension. When you take that line we had earlier, and just assume it does have a size and extend it up, move it up, and connect the respective corners along the way, you get a four sided square. Let's look at truncation and rectification. So, truncation is when you cut off the corners to, to a certain extent that isn't all the way. And you cut off the corners by line segments in two dimensions. In three dimensions, you cut off and make new faces. In four dimensions, you cut off and make new solids. But we'll get to the more details of the, the truncations in those higher dimensions. Imagine just drawing a square, as shown. Now cut its corners, as shown. You get an octagon. So the octagon is indeed a truncated square. Let's look at rectification. It turns out rectification is just a complete truncation. It's the most you can truncate an object. And a shape, rectified, is the same shape. But a shape truncated has twice the amount of size. This is always true in two dimensions. And well, in, two, in three dimensions, is not always the same shape. For example, the cube and the cube octahedron. But we'll get to that. For now, Rectifying things is simply cutting the truncation to such an extent that the truncation have to pass through each other if you got to continue more, and thus they don't become a polygon. See, a polygon is a shape that is closed and doesn't have any lines intersecting. And they also have to cover an area, which means they have to be closed. So two parallel lines won't make a polygon. This is actually why polygons with two and one sides don't exist, based on the definition of polygons. Okay, let's look at stellation. Stellation is extending the edges of a polygon. Unlike polygons, polygons can only start at shapes that are five-sided at pentagons with their edges extended. Do you know why? When you extend the edges of the other, t of the equilateral triangle on the square, they'll never meet. Because the edges of a square are parallel to each other. And based on mathematics, parallel lines never cross each other. Pentagrams is actually the star shape you're familiar with. Turns out there's a pentagon inside. Here's a more accurate representation of the hexagram, heptagram, octagram. We're extending the edges. You take a polygon and extend their edges until they meet in both directions. Now, stellation is going to come in handy later on in three dimensions, but let's move on. Okay, in two dimensions, there are shapes that don't fit the requirements for a polygon, nor a polygram. And these shapes are called non-polygons. And there's one that is probably the most famous 
easiest and most common, a circle. A platonic solid, like the tetrahedron or the cube, is a shape made of only regular polygons. And all the faces are the same regular polygons, all the number of polygons that made it a vertex are the same, and the shape must be convex, meaning that it's closed, not open. There are five platonic solids, let's look at them one by one. The tetrahedron is a pretty simple shape. It's the simplest shape in three dimensions. Pretty simple, looks something like this. Now this model is where the green edges you see form the triangle base, and the upper lot and the, these lines point up. In other words, this is basically a triangular pyramid. But now, why is this a platonic solid? As you can see, all the faces are triangles. It has four triangle faces, six edges, and it has four corners. We're all familiar with the cube. You see that there is a, a yellow square and a red square. The square is being extended along these purple lines, which means that the cube is a generalization of a square in three dimensions. And the cube has six square faces, 12 edges, and eight corners. Here's the octahedron. Now look at these two. You can see that the front and back faces represent the front and back sides of the cube. The top and bottom faces represent the top and bottom corners, the left and right faces to represent the left and right corners. And all the faces represent each of the corners. These four represent the the top four faces represent the top four corners, and the bottom four faces represent the bottom four corners. In other words, this is a dual. So what it has is instead of eight corners, six corners for each face. Eight faces for each corner on the cube but 12 edges. So as you can see, we inversed, we just flipped around the pop properties. The dodecahedron. It's called that because it has dodeca, which means 12 faces. As you can see, the faces are all pentagons in this regular dodecahedron. Now, there are 30 edges, 12 pentagon faces, and 20 corners in this shape. Last platonic solid on our list is the icosahedron, and it's the most facet. Not because it has the most eyes of all the platonic solids, but because it has 20 different triangular faces. The faces are equilateral triangles, and turns out it also has 12 corners and 30 edges, along with 20 faces. But the dodecahedron has 30 edges, 12 faces, and 20 corners. Here it's 20 faces, 12 corners, and 30 edges. Now think about what that means. It means that the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, just like the cube and the octahedron, are duals to each other. Their properties are inversed. Now, Generalizations of these in higher in dimensions higher than five don't exist, so we only see these pair this pair of of dual of dual beauties up to four dimensions. Now truncation and rectification can be generalized to three dimensions. But now here's a rule. Two shapes that are dual, if you rectify either of them, you will get the same result. A combination of those two shapes. So, in the case of platonic solids, we can truncate the cube and see what shapes we get. Remember the rule of truncation we learned in two dimensions. Cut off each of the corners and make a n minus one dimensional shape on it. So cut the corner of the cube to make its vertex figure, a triangle. You each get a triangle for every single one. And this is because if you place a cube corner first, its, its first cross section is going to be a triangle. We don't really have a special name for this, so we'll just call it a truncated cube. This, the truncated cube is also something we call a Johnson solid, but I'll get to Johnson solids a little later. Okay, now let's rectify the cube. Remember that rectification is a full truncation. We'll truncate it, we get triangles 
that literally form new squares at 45 degree angles and the original sides of the cube diminish and now we have eight triangles and six squares. Given that the cube has six square faces and the octahedron has eight triangle faces, we can conclude that, that the result is a hybrid of the cube and its dual, the octahedron. We have a special name for this, the cube octahedron. Okay, let's look at its dual being truncated and rectified, the octahedron. The octahedron's vertex figure is a square, because when you cut it off the corner, it's basically two pyramids attached, and when you tr cut a pyramid, you basically get a frustum, which is a shape that is a non, which is generally known as the truncated cone, but it could also be the frustum of any pyramid. You do this for all six corners, and we get six squares and eight triangles. Okay, rectified. Oh, we got eight triangles, six squares. It's the cube octahedron, again. Okay, so we can conclude that when you truncate either a that when you rectify either a cube or the octahedron, in each case you get a hybrid of the two shapes. Let's look at the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. When you cut the icosahedron, because the top each corner is on the top of a pyramid, when you cut it off, the vertex figure is a pentagon, leaving you twenty triangle, leaving twenty triangles and twelve pentagons. When you, cut, when you rectify, you also still have 20 triangles and 12 pentagons. A hybrid of the icosahedron and its dual, the dodecahedron. This we have a special name for, the icosahedron. We've confirmed that the icosahedron, when you rectify it, you get a hybrid of its, its and its dual, the dodecahedron. Let's try cutting off the dodecahedron. It might not be so obvious since they're not on the top of prisms, but the vertex figure of a dodecahedron, if you connect edges, you get a triangle. So when you cut it off, the vertex figure is a triangle. Unless you're directly at the middle. But when you cut it off, you get a triangle. Since there are 20 corners, it's now 20 triangles and 12 pentagons. Now that we're cut it, it's actually more of a decagon. And so here it'd be hexagons for the cube, it would be octagons, and for the octahedron, hexagons as well. We have this icosahedron, we have this dodecahedron, we rectify the dodecahedron, and we get 12 pentagons and 20 triangles. It's the icosahedron. Same result as the icosahedron, which also confirms the fact that any shape it rectified is the cross hybrid of it and its dual. And when one shape is rectified and its dual is rectified, in both cases, you'll end up with two of these hybrids because they rectify to the same shape. So the vertex figure for the icosahedron is simply the regular faces of its counterpart, the dodecahedron. Now here's one last thing to know. Self-dual. When a shape is self-dual, it means that if you took every single one of those numbers and aligned it, when you inverse them, it's going to be the same. It's always going to be the same number. So the tetrahedron is self-dual because 4, 6, and 4, if you combine them all into one number, 464, that number is a palindrome which means it's the same red forwards and backwards. Turns out all polygons in two dimensions are self-dual, which is a key to understanding anti-prisms. So, prisms. There's an infinite amount of prisms because there's an infinite amount of polygons. Turns out the cube is a prism. It's a square prism because it's extending a square. For the triangular prism, you're extending a triangle. For the pentagonal, a pentagon. And the hexagonal, a hexagon. So a prism is an extension of a shape that is not a square. And even non-polygons can also be extended, but they don't result in prisms because prisms are polyhedrons, which means they have flat faces. The tetrahedron is a kind of pyramid. It has a base, a polygonal base, connected through a strip of triangles. Really, you can think of taking the middle point, extending it up, and having lines that 
meet at that point. Now, let's look at another kind of shape called the antiprism. So this would be a tri triangular prism. You have one triangle up here, a triangle down here, connected with a strip of one, two, three, four, five, and six triangles. There are other antiprisms like the square antiprism and the pentagonal antiprism, hexagonal antiprism, heptagonal, and octagonal. There are infinitely many antiprisms and prisms as well as infinitely many pyramids. For the same reason each time, there's an infinite amount of polygons. Even these can be either oblique or right. Right is where the height is perfectly lining up in the inside, and oblique is where the height is just stripping off one of the corners. Let's bring our dodecahedron back up. Imagine having a dodecahedron except where the faces aren't have all regular polygons, they're all rhombuses. That makes a shape called a rhombic dodecahedron. And it looks like this. This is an example of a Jonathan solid. It's not a prism. Jonathan solids aren't always prisms. Why is this a Jonathan solid but this is not? Even when they're both polyhedra but not really platonic solids. Jonathan solids are made of regular polygons, but they aren't among the platonic solids. Any shape that is made of only regular polygons that isn't either the regular tetrahedron, the cube, the regular octahedron, regular dodecahedron, or regular icosahedron is a Johnson solid. Only two pyramids are Johnson solids. The square pyramid, which is the shape the pyramids of Giza are in, and the pentagonal prism, which looks like this. Since they are regular, since they are only made of regular polygons, pentagonal and square are made of equilateral triangle faces around the strips. But for hexagonal, when you tile triangles onto six of them, it just forms a hexagon. So really, you need isosceles triangles, which aren't regular, for hexagonal prisms. And for everything higher, which explains why only those two pyramids are Johnson solids. Back to this swampic triconcahedron. Now you can see why this isn't a Johnson solid. Based on a definition, the Johnson solid is a shape that is made of only regular polygons that isn't among the platonic solids. Or, in other words, another definition, it is a non-regular polyhedron made of only regular polygons. Now let's get a little bit mathy. Okay. You probably know the Pythagorean theorem on a tri on a right triangle. The hypotenuse squared is the, is the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Now look, if you take a rectangle and you take its diagonal, you split it into two right triangles. In other words, the Pythagorean theorem helps us determine the diagonal of a square with side lengths of the, of the sides of the triangle. So, when we generalize the Pythagorean theorem to 3D, it gives us a way to easily measure the diagonals of cubes, like, like so. Now, the diagonal of a cube might seem hard to visualize, but you can do it with any kind of rectangular prism. Here's the formula. Given that sides A, B, and C are there, and the diagonal's length D, D squared is equal to C squared plus A squared plus B squared. What is a stellation? In this case, you're extending the corners of the edges until they meet. Here, we're taking a rhombic dodecahedron and extending all the corners in the same direction as the edge they fit with until they meet. And we're also extending them in both directions, again. And I know this is a rhombic dodecahedron stellation because you have one, one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And turns out any polygram has the same amount of arms as its original polygon that it was born from. Same with the stellation. So the number of spikes on this is the same as the amount of faces of the shape that was extended to make this. Same with our polygrams. Here's some more. The extent the stellated dodecahedron, stellated icosahedron, bonus a stellated rectified shape 
the stellated cube octahedron, which was the rectification of the cube or the rectification of the octahedron, as we talked about earlier. So an n-dimensional generalization of this, or the polygrams, will have the same amount of spikes as the amount of n minus one dimensional parts in it. Now let's look at four dimensions. Okay, given these four dimensional axes, remember we have x, left and right, y, up and down, and z, front and back. Now we really don't have a good definition to the direction w. For now we're gonna call it hyper left and hyper right. Really, there's not really a good way to define this direction in three dimensions because there's no way to map it perpendicular on three dimensions, but on paper or on a two-dimensional screen, it would look like this. And based on optical illusions, it would look perpendicular. But really, it's hard to really visualize them as perpendicular. What are regular polychora? Okay, they're made of this they're made of only platonic solids, and they're made of the same platonic solids. The same amount of platonic solids meet at each edge and each corner. So let's look at the simplest of the regular polychora. This. The flash cell is simply a generalization of the tetrahedron to four dimensions. So what you do is that it has five and it has five tetrahedrons, but it's a generalization because it's a pyramid in four dimensions. So as you can see, I put a dot in the middle and we took these lines that go in and converge at that point. They meet there. And that's a fifth of vertices. So there's one, two, three, four, four, and five vertices. Turns out for every dimension n, there's n plus one at corners in a simplex of this dimension. This has five tetrahedra, ten edges, ten triangular face triangular faces, and five corners. Oh, by the way, remember this shape is self-dual. Okay. Let's move on to our next shape, the tesseract. What is a tesseract? This is a tesseract. But really this isn't perpendicular. This isn't a fourth perpendicular axis. This line isn't a fourth perpendicular axis. But because of it being not able to model four perpendicular axes in three dimensions. This is a generalization of the cube we had earlier. So here, what do I mean? I have this red cube, and this I have this red cube in front, and this orange cube in the back. And I see these the, these purple lines connecting the corners, which tells me that that this cube is being extended along this axis. So it's a generalization of the cube in four dimensions. It has 24 faces, 32 edges, 16 corners, and well, eight cubes. And with that in mind, let's move on to its dual. The 16th cell. As you might expect, as its dual, it has 16 tetrahedra, 8 corners, it has 32 triangular faces, and 24 edges. Not only does that make it a generalization of the octahedron, it's also a generalization of the octahedron because it is dual to the tesseract. Now, this doesn't look obvious because of the way these two models are arranged, and it's really impossible, because they're in four dimensions, it's really impossible to really model these two such that it's obvious they're dual. Next shape, which is a complicated one, here it is. This. There are 24 octahedra on this thing, 96 edges, 96 faces, and 24 corners. Right now, it's only very easy to count out eight octahedra, the inner, outer, and some more that are lying on with these faces of the cube octahedron, with these square faces of the cube octahedron. But, turns out there are more. Like, some of them might be in, some of them might have bases that are hidden trapezoids. Like, there's one over here with this trapezoid as its base. So, it, this is a really complicated shape, and it's called the 24 cell. But this shape is special. Not only is the generalization of a rhombic dodecahedron, which is not a platonic solid, 
and it fits this platonic solid endeavor in the four dimensions, every simplex is self-dual. And it's the only shape where it's self that is self-dual in every dimension except for four because of this shape. This shape is self-dual because when you invent Inverse it, you get 24, 96, 96, 24. That's the original. When you inverse it, you get 26, 96, 24, 96, 96, 24. So this is really self-dual to each other. This is really unique. This is a unique property about this shape. Now there are two more shapes that are too complex and I probably won't have time to model. This is a generalization of the dodecahedron. This one, a generalization of the icosahedron. As you can see, this one has 120 dodecahedra, and this one, 600 tetrahedra. Instead of using this model that we use for the tesseract, I'm going to use this model of the tesseract. Bear with me, they're the same. It's just, it's going to make truncation easier to visualize. So when, when a four-dimensional object passes through a three-dimensional plane, we see a three-dimensional cross-section of it. And that means that the, that the vertex figure of a tesseract is a tetrahedron. So when we truncate it, it starts to look less like this and more like this. All the corners have been replaced into tetrahedra. And these tetrahedra are really the vertex figures of each of the corners in the tesseract. And if we want to rectify it, we get this. These tetrahedrons are at full growth. So they've grown the most they can. And turns out we can do the same with the cross polytope, or the 16th cell. Here's the 16th cell. When we, when we truncate the 16th cell, we get something that looks less like this, but more like this. This is a truncated 16th cell. And then when we rectify it, it starts to look less like this, and more like this. Let's look at generalizations of the prisms, pyramids, and antiprisms in four dimensions. This is an example of a generalization of the prism in four dimensions. It's a tetrahedron being extended along this axis. Okay, this is pretty simple. This one is a dodecahedron being extended along this set of red lines. And this is a representation of what's called a dodecahedral prism. Let's look at another one. This one. This is what we call an octahedral prism, because it's an octahedron being extended along this line. There are two more I want to show you. This one is the icosahedral prism. As you can guess, it's an icosahedron being extended along this orange set of lines. One more prism, the tesseract. Yep, the tesseract is a cubic prism because it's a cube being extended along this axis. Now, let's look at our next set. This is an example of a prism because these lines all converge to the center. And so, if we take, took instead a cube and had all its corners form lines that converge to its center, we have a cubical prism. Now for antiprisms. This is an example of an antiprism. Turns out, fun fact, this is another version of the 16 cell. It might not look so obvious, but it's made entirely of, te of tetrahedrons. Turns out 12 plus two diagonals for each face is 12. That's 24 faces. That's 24 edges. And this is literally 16 tetrahedrons snapped right next to each other. But how is this a generalization representation of this? Well, as you can see, I made a purple tetrahedron and a green tetrahedron to indicate the bases. And since its base is self-dual, all the corners are attached to the, all the face. See, there's a face below each corner that snaps through the face. So that corner has a line segment going to each corner of that face. For, and this happens for every single face. But to think about it, think of growing this tetrahedron on the inside. These lines move more outwards and outwards and outwards until you get a model just like the one I just showed you. 
So this can be theoretically turned into that cube-shaped model I showed you earlier. Alright, here's another one that isn't so obvious. This one. This is called a cubical antiprism or an octahedral antiprism. See, this is because a cube and octahedron are dual, so they will be both bases. And then each corner of the octahedron is connected to each of the each corner of the octahedron is connected to each of the corners of the face below it. And same with the cube's corners on the octahedron. So this is a cubical slash octahedral prism. We can do this for any pair of dual. The truncated tetrahedron can also have an antiprism of its own, so it's self-dual with itself as well. Okay, now, let's generalize the Pythagorean theorem to four dimensions. Given some tesseract, this. To find its body diagonal, this. We need to find the length of its sides. Given the sides A, B, C, and D, where D is the diagonal, then e squared is equal to a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. This is so easy that for any generalization of the cube, to find its diagonal, you need to generalize the Pythagorean theorem to 4D. You only need to, to square the, all the sides and sum the squares of those sides and take the square root of that to have the diagonal. So, for five dimensions, which looks like this, given these six, given these five sides plus a diagonal, this would be the formula in this case. And so it always generalizes in the same way. Stellation this time is taking every single corner, every single corner of each three-dimensional cell in a four-dimensional shape, and extend them until they meet in the same, in both directions. But now, let's talk about non-polyhedra in three and four dimensions. In three dimensions, it's fairly simple. The sphere, the cone, the tori, and the, the cylinder. There are generalizations of these. The hypersphere, hypercone, hypercylinder, and hypertorus. And yes, there are multiple kinds of hypercylinders and hypercones. Now that we've seen this, what if I told you that this isn't the end of our shapes? There's still some more interesting shapes in three and four dimensions that exist out there. Here's a set of series that exist in only three and four dimensions. The Mobius strip and the Klein bottle. The Mobius strip is a special shape that if you walk on one side, you can get to the other side without ever drilling a hole on the surface. In other words, a painter would have to go twice around the loop to paint the entire thing, but he could paint the entire thing without needing to drill a hole to get to the other side. Yet it doesn't even look like you can, but the key is this half twist right here. That half twist is what makes the Mobius loop the Mobius loop. And it turns out any odd number of half twists will make it a Mobius loop. One half twist, three half twists, or five half twists. It will always be Mobius loop. Now here's a Klein bottle. A Klein bottle is a sub connected sum of two Mobius strips. And it's similar to a Mobius strip. You can get from one face to the other without drilling a hole, yet it looks like you can't. The key is this intersection point. Wait. I said we don't, can't drill a hole, yet we, we don't, don't need to drill a hole, but we do. Why? It's because the Klein bottle can only exist in four dimensions. And since we can't comprehend four dimensions, we can't map what a Klein bottle would look like in a three-dimensional world without using that self-intersection. But an oh, ant walking along could get to the other side without ever crossing an edge. So with the Mobius loop, you can entangle more Klein bottles together, and for any odd number of these entanglements, you will always have a Klein bottle. Fun fact, a two-handle Klein bottle, which is four-dimensional, is homeomorphic to a torus, which is three-dimensional.
dimensions, the first thing we want to look at is regular shapes. There are only three of them in five dimensions and above. In five dimensions, here are what they look like. These are the hypercube, or also called the pentaract, the cross polytope, it's a dual, also called the pentacross, and the 5D simplex, also called the 5 simplex, written with a dash. This is a model of the pentaract. As you can see, it's an extended tesseract along this line. Now, this is an example of an antiprism in five dimensions because it's a generalization of the 16th cell, which was an antiprism itself. This is dual to the pentaract. It, you can call it the five orthoplex, written with a dash. You can also call it the pentacross. And the last shape before I have to go with my models is the five simplex, written with a dash. This five simplex might not look like a simplex that has a point at its center, but it's an octahedron with six vertices, which is exactly how many vertices it has. And every vertex is directly connected to every other vertex via lines. And I had to kind of offset the edges from the middle. So really, to make it perfect, you really have to warp this octahedron. But this is perfectly symmetrical. It's a perfectly symmetrical shape. Now, in six dimensions and higher, the same shapes remain. So it's always the same shapes. Here are the generalizations of these shapes written using the Petri polygon forms, which have outlines of polygons. There's also truncation and rectification with these. When you truncate higher dimensional shapes, you cut via an n minus one dimensional hyperspace. And eventually, you will reach what's called a vertex figure, which is what happens when you cut a corner off. And that shape will be n minus one dimensional and will be replaced with the corner. So as you can see, truncation and rectification still hold. The Pythagorean theorem is simple. The length of the diagonal squared is always equal to the sum of the squares of the length of all the other sides. And for non-polyhedrons, there's always the hypersphere series. There's always the hypersphere, hypercone, hypertori, and hypercylinders. It's hard to visualize all these other shapes. It's just really hard to see all these. You can't, because you can't comprehend them. Now, the last topic before I have to go, it's stellation in higher dimensions. When you stellate something, you extend the corners of each n minus one dimensional component of it and extend them until they meet and extend them in both directions. There are much more things like kissing numbers or sphere packing, but we don't have time to cover all of them. And so we end our journey with a big wimp to higher dimensions as we see that our dimension is not the highest. The only limit is what we can see. Thanks for watching the video I sent you judges. I'm glad that I participated in the science fair. It's really a great experience, especially since this is my first science fair ever. And I really look forward to seeing you in the virtual science fair to hear your feedback.